Welcome to another training video in the Interstate Technology and Regulatory Council's online training series on PER and polyfluoroalkyl substances, or PFAS. This presentation will cover how the interplay of PFAS physical and chemical properties, your site's characteristics, and human actions affect the fate and transport of PFAS in the environment. My name is Chris Higgins, and I'm a professor of civil and environmental engineering at the Colorado School of Mines. The purpose of this video is to assist you in understanding key concepts that underpin PFAS, fate, and transport in the environment, and to illustrate these with a case study. First and foremost, we want you to understand how PFAS structures, particularly their head groups and the length of their perfluoroalkyl tail, are related to the PFAS transport in the environment. We certainly want you to understand the role that polyfluorinated species often play at various impacted sites. And we also want you to be familiar with the various uh, particular processes in the Vado zone, groundwater, and in the atmosphere that affect PFAS, fade, and transport. You might ask, what is fade and transport? Well, this describes the various types of behaviors that PFAS undergo uh, when they're released to the environment. It encompasses physical, chemical, and biological processes that influence the distribution, transformation, and migration of these chemicals. Essentially, we're trying to answer the questions of how far, how fast, and how much of the environment has been contaminated. Of course, there are other things that PFAS, fade, and transport helps inform, but that's the focus of this video. When we talk about PFAS, fade, and transport, we have to recognize that there are two different things that are coming together uh, that we're trying to understand. The first is understanding the characteristics of PFAS. And this includes things like chain length, the head group, poly versus perfluorinated, which we'll talk about, and all of that will affect the behavior of these compounds. Of course, you also have to understand a little bit about the site the hydrology, the site geochemistry, the various types of properties of the soil, uh, and any sorts of co-contaminants or atmospheric conditions that might impact uh, the behavior of these compounds. And of course, understanding the nature of the release is also very important uh, in understanding PFAS, fade, and transport. First and foremost, when we're talking about PFAS, it's important to understand that it's not just about PFOS and PFOA. There's a multitude of different PFAS that are out there and that may impact the behavior of the uh, various compounds at your impacted site. What I'm showing here is a family tree. This is from the ITRC uh, document, uh, which uh, describes the various types of PFASs that can be found in the environment. And what I'm showing you here on the right is a paper where we actually went out and tried to understand what is this diversity of chemistries that are at uh, these uh, sites, particularly those that are impacted by aqueous film forming foam or AFFF. And just to give you an example, when we go out and look at a site that is impacted by AFFF, we're typically looking for on the order of 1,500 different compounds. Now, that's not to say that there are 1,500 different compounds at every single uh, AFFF impacted site. We often see on the order of 100 to maybe 150 different compounds, but there's a potential for a large diversity of chemicals to be present, uh, particularly at these AFFF impacted sites. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is that your analytical laboratories are not necessarily capable of measuring that large suite of compounds. And so for more information, I would encourage you to take a look at the ITRC video on uh, uh, an, a sampling and analysis. One of the most important features of PFAS is they have a uh, fluoroalkyl tail, as illustrated here by perfluoroctane sulfonate, in which case the uh, tail is completely fluorinated, hence perfluorinated. They also have, when you're talking about the perfluoroalkyl acids, an anionic head group. And as I already mentioned before, the tail and the head group are two of the dominant features that affect the behavior of various PFAS in the environment. What's really important is that perfluoroalkyl tail imparts extreme uh, resistance to degradation. So when we're talking about the perfluoroalkyl acids or PFAAs, these compounds are extremely persistent in the environment. They, they really stick around for a very long time. What's important about the head group is that that also allows the compounds to stick at interfaces. So PFAS are very uh, good at sticking at interfaces, particularly air-water interfaces. And this means that when we talk about their behavior, we have to recognize that not only will they uh, partition to various uh, phases, but they also might partition to the interfaces in various environments. One of the other aspects that really plays an important role in understanding PFAS fade transport is the fact that we have polyfluorinated compounds that are present in, in the environment and that these polyfluorinated compounds in particular can have a much wider variety of head groups and their structures. So all of the compounds shown here on this slide are polyfluorinated compounds, the importance of which I'll talk about later, but they also have different head groups. We have compounds that are polyfluorinated that have anion head groups, 
we have polyfluoride compounds that have cationic head groups, a positively charged head group, which means that uh, will impart some unique properties in its behavior. We also have polyfluoride compounds that have both positive and negative charge at the same time, uh, so-called zwitter ions, uh, and that imparts some very unique properties in terms of their behavior in the environment. When we're talking about the anionic perfluoroalkyl acids, these are compounds which, because of that uh, head group, they are negatively charged at typical environmental uh, pH values in the 4 to 10 uh, pH range. They are very water soluble, and that means they generally tend to, to transport fairly readily, but we'll talk about that more in a moment. And as I already mentioned, they are surfactants, so they really like interfaces. Uh, and that's also a, another important uh, role or behavior they um, have in the environment. One of the other important things to keep in mind is that when these compounds are present as anions, they really don't have much of a measurable vapor pressure uh, or very high Henry's Law constants. So once they are released to the environment and get into a water phase, they tend to stay there. This doesn't mean that they can't be released to the gas phase, because they, they can, uh, but once they're in the environment, they tend to stay in the water phase. And this has important implications with respect to treatment technologies. When we're talking about the transport of these compounds in the environment, most of what we know is focused on the perfluoroalkyl acid anions. And so this table here is showing the uh, log KOC values, actually the KOC values, uh, for the various perfluoroalkyl acids in order of increasing chain length. So we see the perfluorocarboxylates in red, the perfluorosulfonates in blue. And what you note is that, generally speaking, as we increase the perfluoroalkyl tail, the chain length, these compounds tend to have a higher uh, KOC value, which means they will uh, more strongly absorb or partition uh, into organic carbon. There is some unique behavior with PFBA we, fully don't, uh, we don't fully understand at the moment uh, that in that it has a greater than expected uh, KOC value. But what this means when we have these compounds released to the environment is that the retardation factors, essentially the ratio of how uh, quickly these compounds are transported relative to, to the water, uh, increases with increasing chain length. So the longer chain compounds are more slowly transported in the environment. Um, and and the, the table here is showing just in some illustrative calculations for a retardation factor uh, with a hypothetical uh, aquifer material. As I mentioned, these compounds really like to stick at interfaces, and so if you have an interface uh, in a particular system, that can further uh, slow transport and contribute to retardation, which we'll talk about again more of that when we talk about the VEDO zone. When we're also talking about interfaces, it's important to keep in mind that you can have non-aqueous phase liquids or napples released as co-contaminants at many of these sites. And these compounds can interact with that napple, both at the napple water interface and actually partition into the napple. They are fairly complex interactions. We won't have time to go into those right away, but there are several good papers out there uh, that you can look at if that's a particular interest at your site. Now, when I presented this KOC value uh, for uh, perfluoroalkyl acids, that is generally the uh, predominant way that these compounds will absorb. They will stick to the organic carbon. However, it is not sufficient to fully describe their behavior in the environment. And in fact, when we see these compounds uh, in environments that have lower pH or have greater uh, abundance of polyvalent cations, particularly things like calcium or iron, we tend to see an increase in the absorption or the retardation of these compounds, an increase in the log KD of these compounds. Now keep in mind that the presence of polyvalent cations and pH, those things co-vary. You tend to lower the pH, we tend to increase the amount of polyvalent cations. But we see this behavior both for the perfluorocarboxylates and the perfluorosulfonates as illustrated here on the right. And the important implication of this is that if you're at a site that has undergone any sort of remediation that has altered the geochemistry, it's altered the pH, it's altered the amount of uh, polyvalent cations in solution, such as in situ chemical oxidation or ISCO, uh, that can change the behavior of these compounds because of the changes in pH uh, and polyvalent cations. So it's an important thing to consider uh, if your site has undergone remediation in the past. One thing I haven't talked about so far is the bioaccumulation of PFAS, and that's certainly going to be talked about a lot more when we talk about the toxicology and risk assessments associated with these compounds. Broadly speaking, though, uh, the longer perfluoroalkyl acids, which are what we understand the most for, uh, tend to bioaccumulate more in animals. So the increase in the BCF or bioconcentration factor generally tends to increase with increasing chain length for both perfluorocarboxylates and perfluorosulfonates. What is interesting is that the shorter chain length compounds, uh, the short chain compounds such as PFBA and, and others, tend to bioaccumulate more in plants. 
So the behavior you see in animals is essentially the opposite of what we observe in plants, which is an important behavior when we're talking about potential exposure. One of the other important things is that when we're talking about polyfluorinated compounds, there's a lot less data out there on the potential bioaccumulation of polyfluorinated compounds. But there is some indication that when polyfluorinated compounds are ingested, they have the potential to be uh, metabolized and transformed to the more persistent perfluoroalkyl acids and thus contribute to the perfluoroalkyl acid body burdens. This issue of transformation of the polyfluorinated compounds is actually one of the most interesting, in my view, uh, issues related to these compounds in the environment. What I'm showing here is an illustration of both the uh, electrochemical fluorination chemistry, uh, which uh, essentially generated uh, perfluorooctane sulfonate and related chemistries, as well as the fluorotelomer chemistries, such as 8 to 2 fluorotelomer al uh, alcohol and its polymers. And if these polymers break down, uh, or if uh, other sorts of polyfluorinated compounds are released to the environment, it's expected that they will eventually transform to the much more stable uh, perfluoroalkyl acids, such as PFOS uh, and PFOA, and other chain length chemicals. And this is very important in that at some sites, particularly the firefighting foam sites, there can be a fair uh, large amount of these polyfluorinated compounds uh, at the site. In particular, uh, polyfluorinated compounds that would transform to the perfluorhexane sulfonate. Uh, and that will become important when we talk a little bit more about the case study in a moment. So when you go out to look at a site that is impacted by PFAS, uh, it's actually a quite complex issue uh, trying to understand what compounds are out there, when they might have been released, and what that means in terms of the behavior in the environment. So the complexity of these compounds very much varies uh, with time, space, and history in terms of what's happened at the site. We generally think of this as a funnel effect in that there can be a lot of compounds that might have been released, including polyfluorinated compounds, and over time, and particularly if, there, if something has happened at the site that has uh, been intended to uh, do something to transform chemicals at the site, these compounds can be transformed to the more persistent perfluoroalkyl acids, or PFAAs. And so when you're looking at a site, you have to think about where you are with respect to uh, where the source zone was and how far you are from the site, whether the plume is old or uh, a fairly recent release, and whether or not there's been any sort of remediation happening because all of those sorts of things, particularly oxidative technologies, can funnel you into these more stable perfluoroalkyl acids. And one of the things that's interesting from an analytical perspective is the, uh, the use of the total oxidizable precursor assay, which is meant to transform these compounds, these polyfluorinated compounds, to the more stable uh, perfluoroalkyl acids. And I have a feeling you'll see a lot more folks interested in using that uh, in, the, in the future. When we talk about transport in the VEDO zone, there's some unique processes that are important to consider uh, with respect to PFAS. First of all, these compounds are not particularly volatile, so we don't necessarily think about them with respect to vapor intrusion or, uh, or soil gas in the, in the VEDO zone. However, they have surfactant properties, so they're very likely to accumulate at the air-water interface. And the preliminary data is suggesting that there can be significant retardation of these compounds in the VEDO zone because of them sticking to this air-water interface where there is a lot of that uh, in the VEDO zone. And one of the other important things is to keep in mind that the VEDO zone is much closer to most of the uh, places where these compounds were released. And so things that are cationic or zwitterionic, which are positively charged, are going to more likely strongly absorb uh, to the sediments in a, in, a, in a source zone. And that can be an important process uh, for limiting their mobility into the, the saturated groundwater uh, at a particular site. Of course, once these compounds do get into groundwater, they're relatively uh, readily transported. Uh, however, they are not all transported the same. The transport is very much chain link dependent, again, linking back to those uh, retardation factors we talked about with generally increasing retardation factors with increasing chain length. And as I already mentioned, understanding the organic carbon and the partitioning of the uh, compounds to the organic carbon is important, but it's not fully sufficient to describe their behavior. And of course, as I already talked about, with respect to in situ chemical oxidation or other types of oxidative technologies, the composition of these compounds in the groundwater can certainly be impacted by any sort of remedial activities that have taken place at a particular site. Now, I focused so far on uh, the fate and transport of these compounds in soils and groundwater. It's important to keep in mind that you can have releases to the atmosphere. And these are generally considered to be associated with stack emissions, so uh, where there might be an industrial site uh, 
uh, that has a stack that has been either making or using these compounds in, in their manufacturing of products. There are a number of cases out there where we've seen atmospheric uh, deposition of various fluorochemicals emitted from the stack. Now, once that happens, they can then get into the groundwater and becomes a groundwater question. But you do need to consider the fact that if you have a site that has a stack, there is a potential for air emissions uh, from that site. Now that you have the fundamental understanding of the various basic processes that affect the fate and transport of PFAS in the environment, we're going to illustrate these with a particular case study. This is a site where firefighting foam was used uh, for a number of years. It was a firefighter training area uh, for about 50 years. And this particular site was also subject to extensive remediation. Uh, this site had a lot of VOCs and semi-volatiles uh, and pesticides, chlorinated solvents, all in the groundwater. And because of that, and as well as the fuel hydrocarbons, there was a lot of pump and treat as well as oxidative uh, technologies, uh, biosparging essentially, at this particular site. In 2011 and 2012, I was part of a team that went out and collected soil and groundwater at the site, trying to understand what was happening uh, to these compounds. Uh, one of the important things that we did here was we not only looked for a lot of polyfluorinated compounds, but we also looked for uh, the potential presence of compounds that we hadn't identified using the total oxidizable precursor assay. This is an example uh, of the site that we were looking at, or the, the, the map, I should say, of the site we were looking at. And what you can see is a historical uh, BTEX plume. Uh, and then, because of the treatment that had been employed, uh, the, the BTEX plume had shrunk. Now, the source zone, where the fire training area is outlined there in the red circle, and the groundwater is generally moving uh, down uh, and to the right. So we went out, collected samples, both from uh, the soil and groundwater, and tried to, get, again, understand the distribution of these compounds at the site. What I'll first start with is the groundwater, since that's what we were uh, initially mainly interested in. What I'm showing here are uh, illustrations of the levels of perfluorhexanoic acid, a C6 compound, per PFOA, the C8 compound, and PFOS, the C8 sulfonate, in the groundwater at this particular site. And what you see is that for the PFHXA and PFOA, these are generally contained within the main part of the historical BTEX plume, with relatively high concentrations, I'll add, and they all tend to be down gradient from the fire training area. What's really interesting is that PFOS does not show the same pattern. And this was the first clue that something very interesting was happening at this site, which we think may be very indicative of what has happened at other sites around the country. The other thing that raised a question for us was the fact that we saw PFOA and PFHXA were also distributed fairly equally, despite the fact that they have different perfluoroalkyl chain lengths. If you remember, when we we're talking about retardation, we generally expect greater retardation with increasing chain length, which means that the PFOA would be transported much less than PFHXA. And that is not what we observed at this site. So that was another question. And this, all of this started us thinking about what might be happening to these compounds at the site. Why do we not see differential transport of PFHXA and PFOA? And why does the PFOS distribution of the groundwater look so different than the perfluorocarboxylates? So now, we're trying to understand why the, we see this behavior and this distribution of these compounds uh, at this particular site. Our first thought was that perhaps there had been additional surface source. Maybe the AFFF that was applied in the burn pit uh, was not the same that was applied uh, at another location, or there had been another surface discharge uh, of uh, AFFF at the site. But when we looked at the soil concentrations, we don't see any elevated soil concentrations anywhere near the place where we saw the elevated groundwater concentrations of PFOS. What was interesting was when we, uh, so essentially we ruled that out uh, as a potential source. What was interesting is that when we started looking at the site in more detail and talking to the site manager, they indicated that there had been a lot of pump and treat at the site. So what we did is we looked at where those extraction wells were, and it turns out they were mainly in the main part of the plume. And so we started thinking that perhaps the groundwater in the main part of the plume that contained elevated levels of PFOS, which we presumed was in the, the firefighting foam that had been applied, had been pumped out. And what we were looking at in this eastern area uh, next to the burn pit was more indication of what the site looked like before uh, they had pumped all the water out. And the idea being that they had pumped all of the PFOS out, uh, mainly from the main part of the plume, but they hadn't pumped this groundwater at this part of the site, and so that was indicative of what had already been there. That makes total sense, except when you think about the perfluorocarboxylates. Now, if you were paying close attention uh, to the video, 
if you look at the KOC values for the perfluorocarboxids, they all are generally less than the KOC value for PFOS. PFOS is actually one of the more absorptive compounds, uh, particularly more absorptive than PFHXA and PFOA. So the fact that these compounds are still present at elevated concentrations in the historical part of the plume makes no sense if you think about them being released as PFHXA and PFOA and the PFOS being uh, removed from the site. It only starts to make sense when you start to consider the fact that they might have been formed in situ from polyfluorinated precursors. And this further was uh, illustrated when we started to look at the results from the TOP assay or top assay. And what we observed is that the precursors were still intact, if you will, uh, in the eastern part of the plume where we saw elevated levels of PFOS. However, there were not nearly as many precursors in the main part of the plume, suggesting that perhaps they had already been converted to things like PFHXA, PFOA, and other compounds. To look at this a little bit more closely, we were interested in the question of biosparging that might have been happening at the site. Was this potentially the reason why we saw the uh, precursors less in the main part of the plume and uh, we saw the perfluorocarboxylates present in the main part of the plume? When we looked at this, we looked at the issue of PFHXS to PFOS ratio. Now, when you look at the firefighting foams that have been analyzed so far, that ratio tends to be around 0.1. In other words, about 10 times as much PFOS as PFHXS in the firefighting foam. Now, keep in mind, I mentioned before that there are a lot of PFHXS precursors in the firefighting foam. So that is an important thing to consider. However, if you don't think about the precursors, when these compounds are co-released, you would expect that ratio to increase as you move continually down gradient because of the greater transport potential of PFHXS. Well, what did we observe? What we observed was that those ratios did increase as you move down gradient, but then they decreased uh, after we moved past the wells where they had been biosparging. In fact, the highest ratios, up to 50 to 1, were observed right around the wells where they have been pumping oxygen in the subsurface to convert the BTACs uh, into other things. And what we think is what was happening here was that the PFHXS was being produced in situ from the aerobic transformation of the various precursors of PFHXS so that we got elevated ratios of PFHXS not as a, a function of transport but as a function of the conversion of the polyfluorinated precursors to the PFHXS. So what I hope you take away from this case study is understanding the role of transport, the role of the polyfluorinated compounds, and the role of remedial activities in potentially influencing the distribution and fate of PFAS at an impacted site. And so when we think about the key takeaways, the key messages we want you to uh, understand from this training video is understand when we're talking about the perfluorinated compounds, these are the compounds that are extremely stable in the environment. They're really going to stick around for a very long time. They are mobile, but their mobility is very much chain link dependent, uh, but it can be affected by things that like pH, uh, the inorganic cations, and they also have the potential to partition to organic carbon. So that's that essentially how they're retarded uh, in the environment, but they, uh, they will move. The polyfluorinated compounds have varying degrees of stability. These are the compounds that will eventually, presumably, transform to the perfluoroalkyl acids over time. And particularly because they have very different head groups, uh, they have highly variable in terms of their mobility and their transport. The cations are probably really only going to stick in the soil uh, and the anions may transport in the subsurface. We generally should expect increased concentrations at air-water interfaces of these compounds or wa water napple interfaces, uh, particularly in the Vado zone, because these compounds are surfactants. They really like to stick at that air-water interface. And when we think about source zones, source zones can be very significant sources of these compounds and uh, there's a long-term potential for discharge uh, basically having to do with the fact that we have exceptionally low criteria in water and fairly high transport potential, which means when you go out to a site, you might have to have a very large investigation area. And the last thing is that if you're working at a site that has deployed remediation technologies to treat for co-contaminants, it's important to consider that that remediation technology is very likely to have affected the fate and transport of PFASs at that site. In particular, technologies that employ oxidation as, uh, as part of the technology such as in situ chemical oxidation, biosparging or aerosparging, or any sort of aerobic bioremediation that is likely going to contribute to the aerobic conversion of the polyfluorinated compounds uh, to the per more persistent perfluoroalkyl acids at your site.
On behalf of ITRC, thank you so much for joining us for this discussion of PFAS, fate, and transport. As you can see, there's a lot of information that you need to consider with respect to the behavior of these compounds in the environment. Also, this information is rapidly evolving as there's a lot of research currently being done on this complicated class of compounds. Clearly, PFAS are going to be a major challenge for environmental professionals for the near future. Please do check with ITRC for the most up-to-date information it is the goal of ITRC to support this effort. Please follow us on social media and visit the ITRC PFAS webpage for additional videos, fact sheets, and guidance documents for PFAS and other key environmental issues.